What if you could really get inside the mindset of clients, patients, and family caregivers? And are you really aware of what it's costing you if you don't? Well, hello and welcome to Reimagining Customer Service and Healthcare. My name is Roger Corville, and welcome to another episode of V2's Thought Leader Conversation Series, sponsored by Virtual Venues, the team with a whole lot of experience bringing you virtual and hybrid event production. But today is about reimagining healthcare service. Uh, customer service and healthcare. However, it comes out of my mouth, and I'm excited to welcome the author of a brand new book who I happen to know is brilliant because I know her from a shared professional community at National Speakers Association, where she is a fellow certified speaking professional. And if you don't know what that is, it means she's an accomplished, real deal. She's the real thing. Jennifer L. Fitzpatrick, MSW, LCSWC, CSP, founder of Generations Healthcare Education, Inc., author of multiple books, including the one we're going to talk about today, Reimagining Healthcare. <laughs> so we're just going to keep doing that, but we're going to keep it real here. Reimagining Customer Service and Healthcare Boost Loyalty, Profits, and Outcomes. And if that's not just keeping it real, welcome, Jen. <laughs> I'm glad you're here. Hi, Roger. Thanks for having me. Hey, um, fill in a gap or two. Tell us a little more about who you are and what you do. Sure. So I have a background as a psychotherapist, but I've also worked in sales and marketing and healthcare for a really long time. And so I have seen over and over and over again, what is in the mind of the families and the patients that we serve, but I also see what's inside the minds of we business people and healthcare, of course, is a business. And the goal of this book really was to sort of help healthcare executives and even clinicians understand not to how to have great outcomes, clinical outcomes, not to fix the broken leg, but how to make somebody comfortable so you're able to more easily fix the broken leg. Uh, you know, and that's a great place to even maybe just start this conversation because I noticed as I was um, kind of looking through the book, and I'd love to tell you I read it for word for word, but I didn't. But but you really are working with a something that is a a complex, multi-sided complication, right? There's complications for the end clients or patients, but then also the workers or frontline employees, right? And then the organizations themselves no doubt have complications that arise out of that. Um, but let's talk about those we serve. I mean, one of the points that you made was, oh, nobody wants to engage with healthcare, mental health, seniors, living system. What's the, what's the fear? What's going on in the mind of those we serve? Well, let me ask you, Roger. Do you look forward to going to the doctor? Just even just for a physical? Is that something you're excited about? No. What a pain in the ass. I'm just going to say it. Yeah. Yeah, well, seriously. So it's not a fear. It's just a pain in the ass. <laughs> and it's not fun. Nobody's saying, yeah, I get to. Get, but let, let, all right, that's pretty routine. But let's say your kid has an addiction and you're looking for rehab, that's even scarier. Let's say that your loved one parent has Alzheimer's, yeah. terrifying. Let's say that you yourself have a very serious cancer. Any interaction that we have with the health or even the mental health system is gonna be uncomfortable at the least, or, and often we just don't feel like doing it, or it's going to be very, very scary and overwhelming at the worst. Right. So I think it's really important that even though for us that work in healthcare, it's routine. A surgeon that works on a heart every day, that's, that's their job. They know what they're doing, but it is a very scary thing for the family, the person who's getting the heart surgery. And so what can you do to make it more comfortable? There's so much data. It's, I mean, it's obviously common sense, but there's so much data that supports the more comfortable the patient is, the better the outcomes are going to be. And if you look at it from a business perspective, which everybody needs to these days, it's not just about clinical outcomes, your reviews, what people are saying, how much reimbursement you're getting, all of that is tied to satisfaction. And in my experience, healthcare organizations just aren't paying enough attention on easy things that they can do to get that. Yeah. Let's talk about those orgs and then we'll kind of come back around to the frontline workers. What are, where are they leaving money on the table? What's, what, 
what are some of the things that are being overlooked? And I know we'll just barely touch that relative to the whole section in your book where you get into that, which is a, my way of saying you should go buy Jen's book. But <laughs> talk about the, the org, organizational benefit. So the benefit to the organization is you're going to have better reviews. You're going to have more word of mouth people saying, hey, that was a nice experience. Give you an example. My aunt was just in a hospital in Florida and it was a very scary experience, but she could not stop talking about how nice everybody was to her. On the other hand, I have a, a really close friend who was just in a hospital in New Jersey. This is all within the same uh, not saying anything specific about those states, but just another example of a totally different hospital system. Right. And she was a wreck, nervous, scared, worried, because people didn't use her name. People didn't seem to remember what she was there for. Sometimes people didn't look her in the eye. It's such simple stuff. And I think a lot of executives think, well, of course my organization falls into the category of what my aunt experienced in Florida. Right. They're nice. People are nice. But are you sure? Do you know that they know how to make a patient comfortable? Yeah. You know, even as you were describing that, I lost a, a grandfather to Alzheimer's and I, my folks live at the time, lived in a fairly small town. And I remember the personal relationship in my case with my folks as caregivers up in, you know, um, but I remember the personal relationship and actually thinking that that was unusual, that they knew mom by name when she came in and could talk about embarrassing <laughs> some, you know, the embarrassing thing that just happened or whatever, right? Cause he was had, dealing with dementia and uh, remembering how that seemed abnormal. And I guess to your point, it shouldn't be abnormal to just go in and not be treated like a number. <laughs> Right. And I think that that's, again, I'll just give you a personal example. One, I'm switching doctor's offices. And one of the reasons is because I go in, first of all, it's a revolving door in the last few years. It's, and then that has a lot to do with the great resignation. That has a lot to do with what happened during COVID. We have a big healthcare shortage, but we right. did before the pandemic. Right. But when I go into this office, the person that greets me doesn't even introduce themselves. Now, a restaurant server comes over to your table, <laughs> not even a high end restaurant, you know, medium restaurant, right. medium. Hey, you, hi, I'm Jennifer. I'm, I'm going to be your server today. I mean, that's a low stakes interaction with a customer. When somebody's going to take your blood pressure, take your weight, I've suffered from uh, white coat syndrome because Sometimes the person makes me a little bit nervous when I when I go. They're not looking me in the eye. They're not using my name. I don't know who they are. And especially with this, a lot of healthcare organizations are still using the masks. So that 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 also impacts your communication with the patient. You know, the friendliness, the smiling, right? The, you know, all of that. So I think it's really just a lot of it is common sense. The basics are very common sense, but. I have to ask, are you doing them? Is the organization truly, are they saying hello? It, we're not talking about huge changes. Most of the stuff in my book, listen, I have some expensive stuff that you can do to improve customer service in your in my book. There's some really great ideas for, you know, I, I interviewed 20 C-suite executives actually, hospitals, senior living, hospice, all kinds of healthcare organizations. But so much of what it comes down to is, is basic courtesy, basic common sense. And some of the most renowned organizations who you know you're going to get great operation, great clinical outcomes, you walk away feeling like, like you said, Roger, like a number, like people didn't really care about you as a person. Yeah, I think... Well, there's, there's both the transaction that happens with each and every interaction, but putting on our business hat, you know, thinking still at the, that organizational level, I could see how in one sense, to use the analogy that you just used with regard to the restaurant server, that restaurant server figures out pretty quickly that even if you're having a bad day, putting on a smile and asking somebody's name and making eye contact, 
makes a difference how much you get paid at the end of the day because of tips. Whereas that you might not have that same direct reinforcement for the person who greets you when you walk in the door to show up for your appointment for that person sitting there. But that doesn't mean there isn't positive or negative impact for the organization, right? I mean, I would imagine there's a number of things that you've identified uh, where people have not helped the case with regard to repelling patients or clients. Right. So let me push back on that a little bit because I think with the restaurant example, you're going to, it's, it's, you're using your, you're, you're going to get that positive reinforcement. You're going to get that gratuity that you so desire as the server. That's what they are hoping for. But what you're avoiding, if you are somebody who works in healthcare, it, maybe you're not going to get that positive reinforcement of the gratuity, but you're going to avoid the negative piece of someone's complaining about you. Someone saying, gosh, I I felt really uncomfortable. Someone writes a negative review. And then you wind up having this conversation with your supervisor. You wind up, it could impact whether or not you get promoted. It can impact. So, and I I think the thing about the the server and, and definitely what you said is very valid, but they get, they know right away and it's not always their fault or or they if they didn't get a good tip sometimes it's not their fault but right. if they do they feel like all right i did a good job i connected with that family or that individual that was coming in for a meal so a lot of times it takes a couple of days it takes maybe a week months oh reports are coming in this the reviews are awful and this name keeps coming up that they were unpleasant that they they made the patient feel uncomfortable that they didn't use the person's name. So it takes, there, there's a lag time. And I think that that's a big problem in healthcare. What can we do to make the reinforcement quicker? Now, one thing that I've seen a lot of organizations do, healthcare organizations do that I like is, and and not everybody does these, but I, I think we as consumers should, when someone sends you a text or an email and it's two seconds, just click. Yes, it was a good experience. No, it wasn't. Give them that immediate feedback because it's only going to benefit you as the consumer. You're going to your pharmacy, your doctor's office, whoever it is that either did a good or bad or mediocre job. They're going to know right away and be able to perhaps provide that feedback. Mm. Yeah, I like that. Well, and I mean, I think there uh, there's probably a lot of things we could talk about about what I could do as the end consumer. But let's let's you. You said something that made me think of that frontline worker, right? And particularly going back a few minutes, you mentioned about challenges even before COVID hit, right? I would imagine uh, burnout or other things have just been themselves pandemic. Oh, I mean, so before the pandemic, there there's actually a great doc that you should, I would love to see you interview. He, he's an expert on his name is Dr. Name Ellisward. He wrote a really great book about burnout. He's out of Texas, but in his book, he talks about the before the pandemic and he wrote his book before the pandemic, 50% of all physicians and all medical students identified as burned out. And actually Becker's hospital review says the same thing. 70% of nurses said that they were burned out. This is before the pandemic. Right. So what do we, th- who do we think we're dealing with now? In the, in, and one of the, the issues that happened is we, you remember, oh, healthcare heroes, people were sending pizzas and donuts and being so- All kinds lovely. of healthy stuff. Yeah, right. You take care of everybody's health. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just like the incentive for the vaccines, like get a free donut, get a free burger. But- uh, but but I did it too. I mean, I, I did. My husband and I, uh, because he didn't have to commute, we were saving a really good amount during the beginning of the pandemic. And so we were like, we picked a place every week. We sent something to say thank you or whatever. And then a couple months go by, we stopped doing it. And a lot of people did. And so not to say that we, the public, need to start sending stuff, but what is a healthcare organization doing to, to keep the motivation up? And that is, it, you can't have happy healthcare customers without happy staff. All the data supports this, but again, it's common sense. Yeah. If you're happy with your job, you're going to be nicer to your customers. 
And, but especially in a high stress, exhausting, scary environment like healthcare, it's more true than I think even in other industries. Is it more than just the bottom line for organizations? I mean, at, at some point, I, I mean, most people go into healthcare would be my guess because we want to help people, right? We care. <laughs> and at the same time, at some point you're running your hospice care facility or whatever. Um, what's, is, is there more to the why, the what's in it for them with regard to the organizations and why they maybe should reimagine healthcare customer service? Well, it's going to be a more pleasant working environment. You're going to have less complaints. You're, I mean, yeah. I mean, think about it. So even if, all right, yes, you're going to have better reviews. You're going to, business is going to be better. By the way, better service is tied to less malpractice claims. In, in fact, there was a really cool study that I referenced in Reimagining Customer Service and Healthcare about Yelp reviews and surgeons that, People go on Yelp now to talk about their surgeons and they're not saying, hey, he didn't fix my aorta. You know, that's not what they're saying. They're saying he was a jerk. Right. So so it's time. It's not just money, but it's time that you have to spend like sitting down with people going through this retraining. But but also, I think it's the reputational piece of it. Look at groups like the Mayo Clinic. They spent so much time. They weren't always the Mayo Clinic. They weren't always known for being great at service. They took a lot of time. They they spent time, Cleveland Clinic, same thing. They spent time saying like, what are our weaknesses? What are our strengths? What can we do differently? What can we do better? But but you were asking besides financial, what are the benefits? A more pleasant working environment when you're not constantly dealing with miserable. Listen, a lot of patients and their families, they're gonna start out as miserable. It's right. not buying a wedding gown. It's not going to Ruth Chris for dinner. This is scary. It's stressful. But they come in and their stress level on a scale of zero to 10, zero being no stress, 10 being off the charts. I mean, they're probably at a 15, a lot of people, for a lot of procedures that someone's going to get. What little thing can you do when, when that person gets de-escalated to a 10 or even an eight? they're going to be more pleasant to work with. They're going to be easier. So it's not, it, yes, it's about the money. Yes, it's about the time invested in having to deal with patient complaints because we all know when, when you have an unhappy customer, it takes a lot of time and it's stressful. So, but, but also the work environment is more pleasant when you're able to meet the patient's needs and not have to deal with extraneous complaints. And you know what? I think, I think you could say that unapologetically, right? I mean, we, we know classic corporate aphorisms like, you know, people don't quit jobs, they quit bosses, right? We know that there, and particularly in some sectors is just a, <coughs> just a real shortage of healthcare professionals in various categories, right? Like, like children's mental health. And I know because of one client that we work with and that's who they serve, but the, but who doesn't want to go to a better place, right? So to me, those kinds of things do have direct bottom line effects, right? We can say, oh, we reduce turnover. What does it cost us to onboard a new employee? But at the end of the day, when you've got an employee that really is serving that end user, well, patient, um, client whatever the i mean i don't know about you but part of why i do what i do isn't for the money it's because i get to serve people and i've worked at those companies where you can't pay me enough money right yeah. i yeah. quit a couple pretty awesome tech jobs at one point just because i'm like this sucks it's not worth this money <laughs> and and that's you're going to attract better talent i mean people that are good at their jobs like you just said they don't want to work in an environment where all the patients hate the service what we want you know most people come in and again anything with health mental health senior living nobody's like yes i get to move to a nursing home nobody's saying that yes i get to put my mom in hospice but 
they hate the idea to start with in so many cases. And then what we want is our good service to get them to the point where they feel grateful that they found us. They feel grateful that we were the provider that they, they got to. So let me just say this before we kind of transition to what we'll call part three, that third section of your book. Uh, if, if you're just listening, if you're watching, you can look down at the bottom and see that I put contact information and, and that kind of thing. But if you're just listening, generations, plural health.com and generations with a J, I love that, but also generations health on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn. And I would imagine that we could talk for hours about just this last section of your book, Reimagining Customer Service and Healthcare. Talk to me about some of the transformation. I love that you even used that word for part three, transforming their mindset and experience. Give us a sampling of, of the kinds of things that you come in and work with people on. So something small that, so the other day, my husband has to go to a new doctor and they mailed him a stack of paperwork that is just, first of all, unbelievable, huge. And they never said, hey, would you like to fill this form out online? <laughs> or so that to me, it's, I, first of all, I think it's lovely when organizations haven't moved totally away from paper. And here's why, because a lot of older adults still, they want paper. Right. And I think it's generationally sensitive. Now, listen, a lot of older adults are very computer savvy, use their smartphones, but a lot still want to fill out a piece of paper. But wouldn't it be nice, wouldn't that have made the customer experience, the patient experience a little bit better to say, Mr. Fitzpatrick, would you like to have, fill out this form electronically, or would you like us to send you this enormous stack of paper? Another example, my aunt just went through cancer. One of her major laments, she actually really liked her doctor. She was satisfied with her treatment, but she went to so many different people who had her file, but asked her the same questions over and over and over again. She's like, you have it right in front of you. Take two minutes before the patient comes in and just look. And it really ultimately, number one, it saves you time because I know, oh, I'm in a rush. I'm in a rush. I'm running late. Well, look at it. Take a couple of minutes. Look. And then you're not, first of all, pissing off the patient and making them feel like, do they even know who I am? Right. And then you're wasting time like, okay, I, I, it's in there, but I already told the woman two hours ago on my last appointment or two days ago, just take those extra couple minutes and like familiarize yourself. It's okay to clarify, but, oh, you're here for, yeah, it's in the file. So it's not huge stuff like there are i mean there certainly are big things that we can do but those are some small things they're not expensive and they just take a little bit of effort and especially the larger organizations the larger practices they have the bandwidth to do it if you're a one person shop i get it maybe you don't have your forms all online or but the people that I serve mostly, they have every ability to be able to do this. Yeah. And let me say something here also that that is one of the things that you and I know as speakers, trainers, coaches, facilitators, consultants, the various <laughs> hats that we've we've worn as subject matter experts. And because you keep saying these aren't big things. But to me, there's this, there's a, a chasm between say the knowledge that you get in a book for 25 bucks or, and what happens, you could buy go buy that copy, a copy of your book for everybody in your, your organization, but there's something that's radically different when you get people into the room and you walk them through uh, stories and hands-on application and thinking about things and coming together as a team going, ah, it's not just about the knowledge. It's about the a whole host of other things that really is part of the transformation. And 
and I'm didn't even I should have even asked you if that's how you approach it because I'm just making an assumption. But there's a but there's something radically different because it's sometimes it's not just about knowing. Sometimes it's about us coming back together, going ah, yeah, we really want to be on the winning team, and we really want to play with players who really want to be here. And yeah, we know some of that stuff, but man, what could we do to take it to the next level? And sometimes that happens in an, in an environment like a training session or, a, or at a conference in a way that isn't just about the knowledge in the book. Yeah. I mean, for example, I'm working on, there's an organization that I'm working with and I'm creating based on the book, uh, five to 10 minute lessons that they're going to do once a week for 12 weeks based on the book that reinforces the messages. And so because you can read a book, you can go to one training and, and, and God bless the organizations that actually are doing this training. Right. That's great. But if, and, and Daniel Bloom from LifeBridge Sinai Hospital, he's one of the CEOs that I interviewed for the book. He says, it can't be a one and done kind of thing. It can't be one time. It has to be layered. You've got to keep reinforcing it. And actually Alan Levin, um, New York Presbyterian uh, Hospital, he is the chief nursing officer and he talked about that their hospital system evaluates how often they're touching the patient what and not not just the the patient in terms of those niceties but also as leaders how often are you you know touching base with your team about these sorts of things so they're really an organization that's putting their money where their mouth is about this. And so, and, and those things take time. Those takes time. They're not going to be something if your organization has terrible reviews and all kinds of malpractice complaints and, and that sort of thing, it, it takes time to undo all that. But ultimately it, it's got to come, you know, obviously Roger, we work with heads of organizations all the time. It's got to come from the top. Yeah. But it also has to be something that's not just, you know, we've all been employees at organizations and somebody says, this is our priority. And then you have one meeting about it and it's over. <laughs> and so it has to see, it has to stick around. Yeah. I think I would be curious to know your perspective on this. This, this comes from my experience and, and, and isn't directly reflecting uh, the book, but you know, one of your chapters had this awesome little alliteration, contagious camaraderie culture. And I remember a, one of my business partners in one of the companies I started a bunch of years ago used to have this aphorism that just stuck with me, which is you can manage people or you can manage numbers, right? And we all have metrics, but what you seem to be describing, and I want your affirmation, if not a story about it, what you seem to be describing are people who have figured out how to balance that and realize that our employees are real people who deal with things. And it's not just about efficiency. Sometimes it's about effectiveness, which has a lot more to do with than sometimes than just the numbers. And I'm curious if, if, how I just expressed that touches down with the nature of how you expressed contagious camaraderie culture. Well, and if not, you can tell me I'm full of baloney. So no, yeah. I, I, I think that when you've got people that, that feel like they, well, well first of all, it's moods are contagious. I, I, I think that, we forget about that sometimes that when when you as a an employee are pleasant to your coworker that's contagious to them maybe they had a horrible morning they they find out their kids failing algebra they're in an argument with their spouse they're having car trouble and they come in and they're they need to serve at the hospital and another employee is short with them you know, every, you always are looking at zero to 10, zero being, you know, the worst you could possibly feel, 10 being you feel amazing. And, and when, you know, it's like everything nudges in, in a certain direction, like, you know, you, every interaction influences. So a boss, a colleague, and then you get the patient that's in the bad mood because they're not happy that they have to be there or they're terrified. And then you're feeding off of each other. 
And so obviously we all have bad days and we all have moments that we're going through our own struggles and stress. But I think to have a contagious camaraderie culture, we need to be looking out for each other as employees. When somebody's burned out, when someone's experiencing compassion fatigue, Piers Morgan did this whole bit uh, about this doctor during the pandemic who worked over 200 days. And it was like this big celebrated thing. And this doctor was constantly being interviewed on the news. And I just remember thinking, this is very bad. This is not good for the patients. This is not good for that doctor. This is not good for his colleagues. And I know there's some people that would push back and say, well, they had no choice. They had no choice. They had no choice. You you can't tell me that somebody that's worked over 200 days in a row during, especially during a pandemic, is not making mistakes. Listen, I'm not saying that this doctor made mistakes, but but they're not they're not more at risk for mistakes. They're not more. um, Are they always going to be in the frame of mind to to listen, to really hear? And so when I think sometimes when and I saw this so many times with clients that, oh, you know, the, great. I have these nurses. I have these social workers. I they they are they're saying they won't take any time off. They're saying they won't take a vacation day. Well, that ultimately can be very bad for your patients because you are creating a culture where they're going to walk out. And I saw that happen so much that they hit a wall. The the managers were like, oh, this is great. This is great. This is great. This is great. We're not being able to hire. And then they walk it. They're like, I, I, I'm, I can't do it anymore. I'm done. Or they get such a complaint from a family or a patient that it is just not worth it that they worked all those days. I was the MC for a compassion fatigue conference. I loved that you just used those words. It was a whole conference where in addition to some educational content, (laughs) it worked with family caregivers and, and, um, hospice workers and various people in that kind and, and also had, you know, like performance artists who would bring people in for, um, Qigong or relaxation or even a dance exercise, just recognizing that, yeah, we're not, we're not robots. I'm curious, does, does that description of what you were talking about of how people can sometimes power through, but then hit a wall, does that touch down? And I don't remember where I read it, but there was one part in your book that where you spoke to the need for organizations to sometimes make exceptions to their own rules in the nation of, in the name of patient healthcare, uh, connect those dots for me. So I think, we, I think it's, listen, I'm a big boundary person. I think we all need to have boundaries. I think organizations need to have boundaries. Like, let let me give you an example. In my company, so I'm a keynote speaker, but I have a training portion of my organization where we do continuing education credits for nurses and social workers and physical therapists, all kinds of professionals. And so there's constantly people taking our classes And they're like, oh yeah, it was a two hour class, but I had to leave 20 minutes early, but I still need my certificate. Well, we're not allowed to give them the certificate. So we we say, well, and that's a boundary we have to uphold, right? It's a boundary we have to uphold. We we can lose our ability to give continuing education if we violate those rules. So we say, I'm very sorry, we're not gonna be able to do that. Would you like to take another class? We try to do something to make the person happy. But on the other hand, there are times when somebody will say, hey, I went to this class and I really didn't learn what I thought I wanted to learn because I I really felt like the description was going to be about something else. And we'll say, you know, let us give you two free classes to make up for your inconvenience, make up for your disappointment. and I empower, and I really do empower my team to just do that because that's easy. That's something we can do and we can de-escalate somebody that's disappointed. And then, you know, Roger, it's service recovery. Somebody is happier. They're going to recommend you. And we also feel like it's the right thing to do in a lot of circumstances. But when you get to like, there are things like 
somebody comes in and you know that they have a drug problem and they're like, Hey, I need like six refills of my Percocet and I stubbed my, my toe. Right. <laughs> but that, I said, I stubbed my toe. Yeah. I can't have my Percocet refill. <laughs> well, that's where you want to say, well, we have, we have boundaries. So it's very different, but somebody comes in and, and they're, maybe they show up a day early for their appointment. They messed up their calendar. If you can fit them in, fit them in, try to figure it out. If you can't, you can't, but that's what I mean by we want to have boundaries because we have to for some things, but for other things, you want to make exceptions. You want to be human about it. Yeah. Sometimes they're, well, because of the work that we do, we do a lot of work with continuing medical education organizations who of course then are doing it virtually. And for instance, you know, and I cannot claim to be an expert or even knowledgeable of all of the requirements <coughs> for continuing medical education credits, the CEs, but the, what you just described was something that you can't control might be what is or isn't required for, for the CE. Whereas, there's something within your control that you can do like, Oh, let's figure out another way to take care of this person. Right. And, um, for instance, I, one client, they require everybody to be on camera all the time. Right. And if somebody has an issue and life happens, the question is, and I know happen to know they go out of their way to make that, make that right to say, Hey, we want to help you get your C, you know, your CME, even if, you know, the kid just ran over the dog and now you got, you got to go do whatever you got to go do. So Jennifer, what questions would you love to be asked by healthcare executives? If we were talking, well, we are talking healthcare executives. What, what, what questions could they be better at asking for whether it's diagnosing the state of their organization or figuring out whether or not it makes sense to bring you in for the conference or hire you to design a program for them. What's the, what kind of questions should they be asking? So uh, what should they, I'm sorry, what should they be asking me or? Yeah. Or, it, or maybe of themselves to recognize whether or not, or how, you know, <laughs> so where and how to engage. Yeah. yeah. So what's, What's an obstacle to us getting customers telling us how great we are? What's mm. what's the obstacle to a patient or client telling us, wow, that was a great experience? Like what my aunt experienced at this hospital in Florida last week, if that's not happening to you, where she's like, oh my gosh, like she couldn't stop saying, it was, she had a very scary situation. It was very stressful. She couldn't stop talking about how nice they were to her. So if you don't have that kind of feedback, listen, not everybody's going to emote. Not everybody's going to say those things. Right. But if the, the reviews and if you're not getting any feedback, if people aren't saying any nice things and they're mostly saying negative, what is in the way? What are the obstacles? What's the problem? And it could be that you've got people that shouldn't be there. It could be that you have people who just don't know what to do and you're making assumptions. And so I write about in the book that a lot of people, there's so much of what, what customer service in healthcare and, and in any field is that's common sense. And so many of us just assume everyone knows what to do. Everyone knows to smile. Everyone knows to say hello. Everyone knows to introduce themselves when somebody comes to the the doctor's office the what does most receptionists say to you sign in here they don't acknowledge you they don't say hello they don't smile they don't say hi um jennifer i'm i'm the receptionist would you mind signing in and we'll we'll call you shortly what are the obstacles is it that they don't know is it they've never been trained sometimes you flat out have the wrong people but there a lot of times it's one of those three things that wrong people a lot of times it's not the wrong people though is they don't know or they've never actually been trained on how to do it let me give you another example i was training actually housekeepers at a hospital 
I had a, a, a CEO ask me to do a training for, hosp- for their housekeeping department because they were getting a lot of complaints about housekeeping. People, their clinical outcomes are terrific. They're getting complaints about the housekeepers. And so, and I met this group of people and they're so nice, so down to earth. And when we started doing role play, which I, I like to do some role play because, well, for a variety of reasons, but right. they, I said, all right, this is the scenario. I'm sitting in my hospital bed. I just vomited on the floor. Who wants to come in and, and show us exactly what you would do? And somebody comes in, and this, I was told it was one of their stars, comes into the role play scenario and they just start pretend mopping. They don't knock. They don't say hello. They don't say, oh, I'm so sorry that you're not feeling well. So, and that's what we taught that day. That's what we taught. Like, that's great that you're coming in to fix their problem, but this person needs like a word, maybe. Oh, I'm sorry you're feeling lousy. Let me get this taken care of for you. What a perfect example, though, of how everyone contributes to the success of the team. And something is specific or isolated as housekeeping might be part of what's keeping the team from maximum performance. Billing. I mean, mm. <laughs> just billing. And, and of course, one of the biggest ones that I feel like I, I can't wrap my head around how a lot of receptionists are hired because they are answering the phones. They're the first person that's seen and the indifference that I see at so many organizations, it's it's just such a bummer because it can go a long way. Like they walk in and they're nervous. They're gonna get a test or they're gonna, you know, the person that that just says sign in, that oh they hello, how are you? Just and by the way, I I how are you can be loaded. You don't have to say that because it can lead to a really long conversation you don't have time for, but hello. Yeah. Smile. Welcome. Here's where you sign in. We'll call you when, when we're ready. The other day, so I, I went to a new eye doctor and my eye doctor had retired after many years <clears throat> and I walk in and I'm always early for everything. And I get there like my appointment's at 10 o'clock and it's nine 45 and I'm checking and the person's like, hello. And they were fine. They weren't, they were neutral. I wouldn't say they were particularly friendly, but they weren't rude. So I sit down with my laptop because I always have it with me and I'm working and now it's 10, 10. So I go up to the receptionist. I say, hi, uh, can you please tell me how much longer, how much further behind the doctor is running? And she said, the doctor is running on time. And I said, well, it's 10, 10. My appointment is at 10 o'clock. It's like, can't this person just, say, oh, I'm so sorry. You're right. They are a little bit behind. Let me check on that. Or, you know, I think it'll be within a few minutes. Sorry for the wait. It's it's okay. Like, and, and listen, there are people that become very upset that they have to wait, but I didn't even care that I had to wait. I was just curious. Honestly, I, my thought was I can run next door to get, because there was a post office next door. I'm like, oh, if it's another 10, 15 minutes, maybe I'll run. I have to mail something. But It just like, you're telling me something that's, I I clearly can see the clock. And so there was just a disconnect there. You just made me think of something that I used to, (laughs) I I used to say uh, not to healthcare staff, but (laughs) it was always a piece of me that wanted to go is my time. You know what? If you're 45 minutes late on my appointment, I'm going to send you an invoice. Right. Because if I if I don't show up, I'm going to get the invoice for, you know, because your time. And I just always felt, well, wait a minute. How is my time You're communicating to me that my time showing up and then waiting? Now, I understand there is um, there are extenuating circumstances and people deal with emergencies and that kind of stuff. I don't want to be um, unempathetic there. But you at one point in the book spoke about literally repelling patients and clients by whether it was how hours were um, 
handled or limiting visits or um, insisting on telehealth when an in-person visit was required. And I just remember that really resonating with me going, oh, yeah, like, and, and I love her, love my dentist, but she works three and a half days a week, right? <laughs> so that's not convenient necessarily on my time. And, um, and I'm just like, oh, you could work a little bit later one day of the week would be really useful for me. Now, I'm glad you your practice is where you only have to work three and a half days a week, but... <laughs> And you know, Roger, though, here's the thing that we have to remember as consumers, though, is they, there is a shortage of all these different professions. And so, but that doesn't stop us from taking our insurance dollars and our private pay dollars elsewhere if we're not happy. So it doesn't, so they can decide, hey, this is, this is my hours. But we also, yes, if they want happier clients maybe she's okay with this is it this is my boundary so i think it really just there but but we also the consumer always has to remember they have every right to take their insurance or their private pay dollars somewhere else and that's how organizations get the message do you and honestly this is may or may not even be a fair question Is there social media monitoring? I mean, there are official mechanisms that organizations use to gather feedback. Hey, did you was did you like your visit? Did you not like your visit? Is there social? Do they manage social or view social media for comments? I'll I'll share with you where my example comes from. As a fellow speaker, we're in Facebook groups where behind that are closed, right? And and in our Facebook groups, for instance, I'll just use this as an analogy. I can't tell you how many times that one of our compatriots who are professional speakers goes, hey, I got an inquiry from such and such a speakers bureau. How are they to work with? And somebody else weighs in and goes, yeah, they paid me two months late or whatever. And that kind of word spreads really quickly. So that's kind of an informal way of, so I'm just curious if there's any of that kind of monitoring oh, available yeah. in oh, yeah. healthcare. Cause I mean, we know we're talking about it on social media. So there's a few, I mean, just give you one example. I, I live in a small town outside of Annapolis, Maryland. It's called Kent Island. And there's this Facebook group. It's actually called Kent Island Happenings. And they eviscerate businesses Mm. constantly. If, oh, this office, this, and not just healthcare, but everything. Um, But, but yeah, I think, yeah, like for example, there are Facebook groups for, I'm, I'm in one that has to do with the nursing home industry. And they talk about their, way they're being treated by their, their company. Mm. And I'm a consultant, right? I'm a speaker, coach, consultant. I, I know the pro it's, it's, I, I got invited to this group for a variety of reasons, but, but yeah, I'll hear like what's happened with a patient, what's happened with a resident. And so absolutely. And, and people also, and, and I'm sorry if I'm going too far off of, no, go for it. I mean, I mean, the goal is awareness at very least, you know, realizing that, yeah, these conversations are happening oh, online yeah. and, in, in a heartbeat. And also the ones that I see, I even see them on LinkedIn. Like people will, they'll, a professional will describe some organization that they're liaising with for about, on behalf of a client and they won't give the name, but it's so obvious who it is. Like, oh, we had that, you know, because you know, like, all right, there's only one memory clinic in this town where these people are talking about. You're like, all right, well, I know where that is. And I know, hey, that's interesting information for me as somebody that will make referrals. So people think they're being so, if they're not using a name, that they're being discreet and and they're not. Yeah. And it's, it's kind of the opposite of like 
what you mentioned before, there are certain, there are parts of our client base who still want the paper, but there's this whole thing where there are digital natives who live online. And part of that isn't just how they fill out a form. It's where they have community and, and it's a whole lot more reach than me just telling somebody when I'm at, in line at the grocery store about the experience that I had, right? right. Now I'm telling a whole group of people in a heartbeat. Yeah. Jennifer, are there any questions I should have asked you that I haven't? <clears throat> so I guess the big thing to keep in mind, like, look, I would love for anybody reviewing this, I'd love to, to help your organization, but even if you choose not to work with a professional like myself, just start looking at what are your obstacles? Like what is in the way of getting awesome reviews? What is in the way of your patient saying, hey, I was scared to come in, but now I'm so glad I utilized you. What, 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 are the, what are the obstacles? What's keeping you from that? Is it your people? Is it your processes? Is it a lack of training? Is it, you know, is it that there's a lack of buy-in from your staff? Try to, try to think about that. And I think also do something, do something small. Even if you can't bring in help from a professional, what small thing can you do just to make sure people know the priority of the little stuff like that, that is big stuff that's free. Smiling is free. Saying hello is free. Using, introducing yourself to a new client is free. Just the little small things, just because your patient will be easier to work with. You'll be able to help them better. And never mind, yeah, they're going to say nicer things, but somebody that's tense is easier to help or less harder to help than someone that's patient, that's calm and relaxed. Someone that's relaxed in a ball of nerves or feeling confused or they're, they're just, they're just going to be harder to help when someone feels like they, all right, this person's nice. This person's pleasant. This person seems to be caring. They're, they're going to be just so much easier for you to serve and it, it, it benefits you. It benefits them. It benefits everybody. Dare I say, I think that even benefits the world. I mean, absolutely. I, I don't even think that's a hyperbole. I think, I think no, it's not. there's a way that you are helping people who help people that, that really makes the world a nicer place to be. And I, I love that. If someone wants to get in touch with you is, I know there's a lot of ways to get in touch with you and, or check out more of your stuff. What's the best way to connect? generationshealth.com jen at generationshealth.com contact at generationshealth.com but you can find us on facebook instagram linkedin and that's generations with a j j if you happen to be listening to this well jennifer thank you so much for spending a little time i know there is a deep well beyond what we managed to get to here today the book again reimagining customer service and healthcare boost loyalty profits and outcomes and i know that's not your only book in fact maybe give us the fifty thousand foot flyby what's your other book oh sure cruising through caregiving reducing the stress of caring for your loved one that was written from the opposite perspective so how a family caregiver navigates the healthcare system. Got it. This is how the healthcare system navigates the patient and the client. Thank you again for taking Thank a little you. bit of time. And, uh, and for those of you who are listening, I really do hope you'll just uh, reach out. I actually know that one of the most beautiful things about people in national speakers association is that it is genuinely one of the nicest groups of people that I've ever had a chance to be part of. And I would just encourage you to reach out to Jennifer and her team. Um, even if you don't think you're a potential client, because I know what a helping heart she has, because honestly, you don't get to earn the designation in our industry that she has without just being a genuinely nice person and helping, helping people get where they need to go. So with that, each and every one of you appreciate you spending a little time with us today and we will see you on the next.